The Apex is a weird motherboard. It's a strange machine, but probably my favorite one. Um, it comes with features that you'll see in no other, and for good reason, because um, this is supposed to be the world champion overclocking machine. And so today, obviously, I am reviewing the ROG Maximus 11 Apex, and I'm already regretting doing so. I've never done an Apex uh, review before, and for good reasons. There is so much to unpack, and everything has to be custom made through my animations, but I'll quit complaining. Let's jump right in. The point with Apex is that it is an extremely focused motherboard, meaning it is here to allow extreme or beyond extreme overclocking. I mean, you're talking about air cooling, uh, all-in-one water cooling, custom water cooling, and liquid nitrogen cooling, which sounds like something very bad, and it is. Uh, liquid nitrogen, for the one who do not know what that is, is very, very cold uh, cooling. It's going to cool your processor all the way to minus 200 degrees Celsius, and it's not something you can really uh, sustain for a long period of time. Something you just do for an event, show off. You keep your computer in a very, very cold state for about an hour or two, and get your processor to run frequencies which it was not designed to run at. For example, uh, an i7 8700K, which is designed to run about 3 or 4 gigahertz, can be overclocked to close to 8 gigahertz or 7.8 or 7.9 which is a world record and of course the number one world champion record uh -huh, is the apex motherboard the only motherboard which can achieve those kind of performances and of course it comes with very selective features but in the same time asus is trying to keep this motherboard as mainstream as possible strangely meaning that enthusiast builders who wants to boost an apex just because of the aura there is around this crazy machine and work it and, and operate it with an all-in-one cooler so you're gonna have heat sinks you're gonna have rgb you're gonna have things that you usually have in a smaller or more broader uh, motherboard and I know I've been playing with my hands but I know you like it all right so let's jump right in the rock Maximus 11 apex comes in an ATX form factor meaning 30.5 centimeter long for 24.4 centimeter wide on its back we can find padded thermo shields on its VRM soldered points only and that will ensure heat dissipation and further protect it against water condensation it is powered by an LGA 1151 CPU socket which support the 8th and 9th generation of Intel core processors VRM wise this is of course where the main focus is we have eight phases delivered by 16 power stages all of which are dedicated to the cpu that is a massive amount of power stages and i mean a total we're looking at close to a thousand ampere and it some might say it's overkill to have 16 power stages and probably is but consider this the more power stages and chokes we have the more uh, surface area we have uh, on which we can spread uh, the heat of the of the electricity we're dispensing, meaning that uh, with 16 power stages, even overclocking uh, i7 or an i9 will not produce that much heat. Actually, you could even run uh, an overclocked i9 without any of the heat sink which did come with the motherboard. It's only when you start really pumping this overclocking in extreme conditions with um, custom water cooling or liquid nitrogen that you're gonna start seeing some heat. So uh, when you're looking at overclocking, the extreme overclocking, the more phases you have, the more power stages you have, the better it is. Memory wise, again, nothing normal. We have a 64 gigabyte of DDR4 RAM overclockable up to 4.8, yes, 4.8 gigahertz in a single channel configuration. This is wild. And th that's why, I mean, Apex is known for this. Usually when you get an Apex, you have uh, uh, a year or two in advance in terms of clocks. But I think that 4.8 is pretty much uh, the limit of what any kind of RAM module 
can uh, output or run at. And only two companies can manufacture RAMs at uh, that kind of speed, which I'm gonna put here, I think it's G-Skill and another weird one which I don't know about. And the single channel configuration does make sense uh, because it gives us the most straightforward um, layout on your motherboard and it also diminishes the amount of elements and components which you have to put on it. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about signal, obviously it's a better thing as well, but the fact that you have less component of your motherboard when you go to liquid nitrogen uh, cooling, that it's a better thing. It has less risk to break something. The least you put on this motherboard, the more robust and less things can go wrong, if I make any sense, if you get and catch my drift. Storage-wise, we have a DIMM.2, which will take care of our M.2 solid state drive needs, up to two of them. Since our D390 chipset is obtained ready, we can expect speeds up to 32 gigabit per second in data swaps, and for once, I believe it, since the DIMM.2 does come with a rather impressive and good-looking padded heat shield. And again, it makes sense, because like I just mentioned, you do not want to have more components that you would need on a liquid nitrogen cooled motherboard, so having them on the DIMM.2 and not scrambled around the GPU somewhere as we find them usually is a very good and rational move from Asus. All right, so export-wise, we have four third-generation PCIe Expresses, one single slot, single speed, and three 16 slots with different speeds. Only the first and closest one to the CPU can deliver up to 16 bus speed, meaning that is where you want your GPU to be in for optimal performances. In a dual SLI or Crossfire configuration, these PCIe Express slots will be sharing their bus speed, giving an 8x8 eight eight speed configuration. Finally, our third and last PCIe Express has been capped to only four bus speeds, so not really recommended for GPUs. Since our first two PCIe are the one most likely to carry the heavy weight of our video card, they have been metallically reinforced for extra robustness. And SATA-wise, we have our usual third generation six SATA plugs, which can all transfer up to six gigabit per second and operate at red zero one five and ten. Back IO wise first, let me note the presence of an integrated backplate, which is always a great idea. So next I want to note and upload the absence of an integrated GPU on this motherboard. I know some people really are looking forward to it and they love this option, but when you're looking again at overclocking, uh, the HDMI and DisplayPort are the most um, sensitive components on your motherboard and when you start to increase the voltage on your phases when you're really overclocking your processor it, it bleeds out it starts to also increase voltage on uh, your integrated gpu components and so the very first one will burn if anything will burn in your motherboard are the integrated uh, display output and anyway any serious extreme overclocker will start its overclocking by shutting those one in the BIOS, so we're not gonna miss them. And I think, again, less components is a straightforward and a better design in general for this kind of motherboard. All right, so starting from the left, we have a CMOS and BIOS button, two PS2 plugs for our keyboard and mouse, six 3.1 first generation, five gigabit per second USB plugs, four 3.1 second generation, 10 gigabit USB plugs, including a Type-C, and a premium five gigabit per second Aquentia, Aquentia. Aquencia LAN plug, our dual band 802.11 AC Wi Fi with a 2x2 Mumimo support, which can transfer data up to 1.73 gigabit per second. And finally, our 7.1 channel Superm FX S1220 adapter. So, evidently, we are talking about a more connectivity focused back IO and rather premium components altogether. And keeping in the IO, on our board, we have two second generation USB connectors, two 3.1 first generation USB connectors, and one 3.1 second generation type C front panel connector. So far, we have covered the more general aspects of our motherboard, and as I like to say, it's already, already mind boggling. But in order to support and to complete uh, this crazy configuration, this crazy 8 phase 16, uh, out uh, uh, power stages VRM configuration, uh, Asus has 
I brought in a lot of overclocking features. And I'll start with uh, the nine nested fan connectors on our motherboard, three of which, the white ones, uh, have been pre-calibrated to deliver full fan speed. And that is something you're not going to see in many motherboards and that will save heavy overclockers a lot of time. So you don't have to go in the BIOS or in some kind of software to adjust the speed of your fans. If you just plug them in those white plugs, you know they're gonna be running at full speed. We also have two water pump connectors, one all-in-one and one for a D5 pump, a QLED screen, which would be crucial in helping troubleshooting the most stubborn configuration, a large and backlitted start and reset buttons, a BIOS switch to toggle between our two available BIOSes, which I absolutely love the fact that you have two bias so you can quickly switch between overall profiles this is something I really really like a retry button for hard resets and a save boot button to well boot in a safe mode and, and, and now we have also a bunch of little switches which usually I don't really talk about but in this very case I'm going to cover first we have this mem ok2 switch which uh, will retune your memory settings to make sure your next boot happens. Next we have a slow mode which will reduce your CPU overclocking ratio to 8 every time your computer is about to crash and which obviously is very useful but also will help you go through benchmarking or stress test. We also have a pause switch which will pause the system and fine-tune your overclocking parameters for you in mid-benchmarks. And finally we have a debugger which uh, is of course a must in this kind of uh, motherboard, but it's not only a debugger, which allows you to know at what boot stage your boot status is, but you also have condensation uh, uh, LEDs. And those condensation LEDs will allow us to know if there is, well, condensation, either on the CPU, uh, the PCIe, or the RAM areas. And that's because condensation is a main enemy or the greatest enemy of liquid nitrogen. They can really short your motherboard. Uh, they can burn the whole thing and the whole setup altogether. So you need to know what's happening and where it is happening to right away shut down your, pro your, your build and try to dry this whole thing together. All right, so this is a Republic of Gamer motherboard and it wouldn't be so if it did not feature a bunch of lighting sync effects. And I'm gonna start with the fact that there are three nested RGB strips right on our motherboard. And the first one is under our IO housing, spelling the name Apex. Another one is under our name shield. And finally, one under the rather good looking chipset Chilled. Of course, if that is not enough, because it never is, we have an RGB aura connector right here and an addressable one right there. In conclusion, the ROG Maximus 11 Apex will cost you about anywhere between 450 and 550 US dollars before taxes, depending which merchant you will get it from. And I'll start by saying that obviously this is not a motherboard for everyone. Asus did try to produce a mainstream motherboard with a wide spectrum of uh, operation. Uh, starting with the medium enthusiast who wants to do some really cool stuff and have a really nice and good looking motherboard. And of course the liquid nitrogen world record user, which obviously uh, this motherboard was focused for. And so if you are looking for a motherboard for your first build or for a good gaming motherboard, I think that you could get something much more relevant to your build at about two or three hundred dollars with a Rock Strix or even with a Rock Maximus 11 Hero, both of which I did review and that you should take a closer look at. But if you are like me, a guy who's really looking to be at the age of technology, and I'm not going to do liquid nitrogen with it, but I just want to be able to build with something or a motherboard which can really push all my components to their limits. And the fact that we can push my, my RAM to 4.8 gigahertz, that I do have a different and a more open layout, a pure layout, something who's been built to resist sub-zero temperatures and which in the future maybe uh, allows me to do crazy stuff with it excites me and if you are this kind of guy who's looking for good looking crazy crazy stuff and crazy crazy overclocking performances this is where you want to be this is where your money needs to be